recording. Mm -hmm. All right, man. So, like, yeah, bro, you said that you got a lot of things going on. Tell me about that. How have you been, by the way? I've been great, man. Uh, just, you know, trying to stay fit, trying to stay, you know, fight ready uh, throughout all of the crazy stuff that's been happening. Um, you know, on top of the pandemic, you know, that Oregon and California and Washington all caught on fire. Yeah. That's been a huge, a huge obstacle right now. Uh, personally, just to be able to get out and train. Um, can't really train outside still. You know, it's just been a big mess, man. Man, it's crazy what's happening, just like in the U.S. in general, man. It's just 2020 has been a crazy year, that's for sure, for everybody. But in the U.S., it's just like I feel it's like one thing after another, after another, after another. You know, it's just one problem after a problem, after a chaos, after a chaos. It's crazy what's happening with the with the, with the wildfires, man. You know, and it had is it true that it all started because of a gender reveal party? No, dude, that's that's that 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 was more of a joke. Um, so, from my understanding, um, you know, I've talked to numerous people, different resources, um, people that have friends that are officers, and you know, there's a lot of rumors going around that it was politically started. But I want to say it's probably more so along the lines that they're just a bad person and the people that were doing it were just bad people. Um, there are rumors that they were arsonists. So every single one of those fires was mostly man-made or started uh, with ill intent. Oh, so, damn. That, that, oh, that's bad, man. Like You mentioned something like political. Tell me, elaborate a little bit more about that. Well, everybody knows with like uh, the way that the federal funding works for uh, these what Trump calls sanctuary cities. Um, basically, he cut off like federal funding to them. And, um, you know, people have these are just left like, you know, conspiracy theories more yeah. along the lines that, you know, because they got federal funding cut off that they just decided to set the whole West on fire. I mean, that's not true. Um, but that's some of the crazy stuff that you'll hear, um, you know, or that BLM and Antifa started the fires, you know, it, it it's honestly a, a huge mess and more along the lines of, uh, you know, people just need to get their, get their shit together, man. It, it's crazy. It, it is crazy. Everything that's happening there, man. I cannot, ex I cannot imagine how it's going to be when election day comes. Cause it's crazy how this is influencing people. Uh, Trump, Biden, was happening and everything. Even even out here, man. Like uh, like two three weekends ago was my birthday, and I had some people over. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> and um, I, there was one um, this Peruvian friend discussing with my American friend about Trump. My Peruvian friend is pro Trump. My American friend is against Trump. And it was like, a, a, how can I say, a civilized argument, you might say. But it, it, it kind of like when they were arguing made me think like, it's insane how influential these things can be for many people, you know, especially the Trump subject. It's just insane. This guy is involved in your mind in one way or another, either whether it's in a bad way or in a good way, in a stupid way, whatever. It's just Man, he's getting into people's heads, man, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's the leader of what we want to say America is like one of the more of the economic, was the economical leader in the world. You know, if, you know, yeah. if you're the president of America, you know, you've got your hand in every global pot uh, situation across the globe, you know? Um, but, I mean, especially on an election year, you know, it's the, the media is getting more involved than I think they've ever gotten involved just because how easy it is to get information out to people yeah. even if it's misinformation propaganda i mean that's what they taught you in in middle and high school was that propaganda has been used since the beginning of time to influence elections and it's at an all-time high now because you can just literally get it sent right to your cell phone so Correct. um they're able to just keep pumping out information keep headlining and I feel like that's what every news agency is just looking for now. The next headline, the next headline and uh, true journalism and true, um, 
true unbiased opinion is is not as popular as it was before you know getting the cold hard facts and, and getting that that information that's real out there to yeah. these people is so much more hard uh than it was you know uh, 20, 10, five years ago you know it's it's, it's a whole different ball game now so yeah especially yes. especially this guy trump like he has uh twitter fingers right like <laughs> he uses well, twitter for it. everything yeah. I'm, I'm sure he probably has some guy that you know he's like all right man i need some one-liners give me some one-liners man let me i'm about, I'm about to hit this keyboard hard <laughs> you know he's like give me top three top three i'm gonna choose one you know? <laughs> Pro um, probably probably it's like that Probably definitely yeah. like that. Definitely, for example, my friend, the the one that I was telling you about, the the one that who's a, a pro Trump, um, he is extremely misinformed about this guy, and is he believes all the tweets that this guy <laughs> puts out there, you know, especially especially he he, he was like saying comments about um how pro uh, how trump is like pro uh black people pro latinos and all that mm -hmm. and i was i was just being uh um neutral in the conversation first of all i was being quiet and everything i didn't want to yeah. get involved especially when it comes to politics especially because those two were like almost getting into an argument i was just staying quiet but in my mind i was like man you cannot be so arrogant with your responses based on social media information you yeah. know but he was like proud of what he was saying <laughs> it's just like funny yeah. and you know one of the things is like uh i like to take a neutral stance on it as well like i i, I don't try to get too involved or involve that too much with my my personal opinion i keep my personal opinions pretty much to myself i try not to post on social media too much about it I mean, when I was younger, of course, I would do that and I foolishly do that because of share culture or click culture, yeah. you know, uh, you know, we see something that we might agree with the headline and we'll just share it without reading or doing our research. And, uh, you know, that's a big problem, too. And I mean, the more research that I've been able to do, I mean, uh, one thing that I thought was crazy that was that deal that Trump just struck up in the Middle East trying to. Uh, bring peace about all these uh different middle eastern countries i thought that was super cool um but you know i i just the whole politics thing for me man it just it gets uncomfortable because it's one of those things where it's like i don't know enough to speak about it so when i don't know enough to speak about something i i usually try to avoid it at all costs because yeah otherwise i'm gonna come off like an idiot you know Man, um, yeah, that is that is that is that is so true. I do the same thing when I don't know a, a lot about the subject that is in question, or or any subject for that matter that people are talking about, and I'm not fully uh, knowledgeable about. I just stay quiet, like exactly what you were saying. You know, I I'm, I don't want to come off as stupid, or say so, something that would come across as bad, or or, or uh, hindering someone else's feelings, and blah blah blah. I just stay okay. quiet. Like that conversation that I told you with my two buddies, I was just quiet all the time, you know? Uh, it's just like, it's crazy. Especially when you talk to someone that is so close-minded on the subject. Mm -hmm. it, it's better to just it's stay quiet because you're not going to go far with them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, and that's the one thing that I like. I like to have a good conversation with facts that I know and facts that they know. And then you can get that, that uh, opinion across, you know? Because uh, I feel like people nowadays are just so triggered the second that you even, like, uh, say, for instance, I live in Portland, right? Yeah. Super, uh, I want to say, liberal and leftist opinionated uh, uh, city. And, man, you wouldn't believe some of the people that I, I, I run into. If, I, if guys are even wearing a MAGA hat. Like, I've seen, you know, these guys, They I, I, I saw one of my friends, he, he stands for what he believes in, right? So if he's wearing a MAGA hat, I see that and I'm like, okay, he stands for wearing that. And I, I respect his opinion, but I'm not going to attack him blatantly for it. Right. Of course. And then I just see a, a couple of my, um, my ethnic friends go up, talk to him, be like, why are you wearing that hat? You know, and just kind of attack him personally at that level. And it's like, I understand why you feel a certain way about somebody wearing a hat. I mean, same with goes with Colby, you know, Colby, Covington, you know, I actually uh, watched a little clip from that presser, um, 
and, you know, uh, you know, respect the Tyron Woodley, you know, he, he wanted to use his platform to make his opinion uh, heard, you know, and that's all that we can do is, is put our opinion out there and let somebody do with it as they please, you know, but taking up, uh, you know, that, that personal uh, uh, route, you know, and attacking people or attacking who they are as a person and using that to define them uh, as a bad person, I just think is unethical, you know. A hundred percent agree with you, man. A hundred percent agree with you. Unfortunately, there are like a lot of people like that that would like uh, bombard you and attack you with what you stand for, what you believe, because your beliefs are not aligned with them, uh, including family, man, like own experience, you know, like when it comes not not only like politics, but like religion and stuff like that. I remember my aunt, God bless her, but she's so into religion, man, but it's like her religion is the only one in the world and anything else is bad and this and that and starts critiquing other people. I remember many, many years ago, we're talking about this, I don't, this celebrity who just had a, uh, um, had her haircut to very short hairstyle and immediately she was a lesbian, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I was like, man, why, why is like that? And everything. And then I remember that she made a comment after that. Yeah, man, when they wear earrings, it's just because they're gay. And I was like, shit, okay. And I even told her, like, hey, on, you know, you know I wear earrings, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with being gay, but it's just like don't define, don't define someone because of what they look or what they talk about and stuff like that or their beliefs, you know, there's more to that. <laughs> exactly. It's just it's just incredible. But you you gotta keep composed with these people, man. They're, like I said, there's no point of arguing arguing with them and stuff like that. You will not get far. No, and that's why I got respect for, for Woodley and for Covington. Um, you know, Covington's trying to prod the pot a little bit more. Yeah. Oh. Did the same that... answer over and over again. Uh-huh. You know, and did his thing. So uh, I respect that. No, definitely, man. Now they're, like, fighting. Who you got in this fight? Oh, man, I got Kobe Covington. I think he's going to maul him. Yeah. I'm not a fan of Kobe, but I got to be objective. I think Kobe's going to win, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, like, uh, the, the whole fight card in general is quite a good one, man. Not only the the, the, the the main card, but the whole card, man, like uh, with Cerrone and all the other guys. It's got to be a good fight card, man. And we got to talk about, uh, I think how you say it, commit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, gosh, dude. A, a phenom rising out of the ashes man coming out of nowhere and and the first ufc fighter to ever get double booked i mean that's just impressive i mean you have to impl applaud the guy yeah. um you know even even if conor mcgregor likes to call him rat lip you know <laughs> it, it's kind of it's, it's messed up you know but um you know i definitely i definitely believe he's going to go in there and probably execute his game plan and, and take the take the dude down and, and, and beat him pretty senseless so i agree with you man definitely side. man he's a he's a he's a rising star uh, and, and and well deserved everything that is coming to him you know he's just like a great athlete great person seems to be uh let's just mm -hmm. hope he he does a well performance because when you get <clears throat> those opportunities the mental game can affect you a little bit you know you can feel the pressure so let's hope that uh mm -hmm. he, he's on point and everything, man. Yeah. So, yeah. But I what I'm, I'm, I'm more great. excited about the um, Adesanya Costa fight, dude. Whoa. Oh. Oh man, I that yeah. that I'm, I, I really want to see. I just hope it's not like the one that uh, with Joel Romero because that was like a boring fight. You know, everybody was so hyped for that fight and everything, and then it, it happened, and then it was like very mundane. You know, but I hope oh, this fight is going to be a war. Styles make fights in that stylistic matchup. It, it, it's one of those fights that can go one of two ways. Either Yoel explodes and makes something happen, or Adesanya keeps playing his long game. Um, and I think Adesanya is going to pick Paulo Costa apart because uh, I think that the Boracino is going to get very emotional um, in the fight after he gets hit a couple times because he's a very hard-headed guy, you know. Even when him and Yoel clashed, he just kept coming forward. And that's why he won that fight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think he's a very strong opponent. 
The only thing I don't agree with is is how lax USADA was on testing with uh, people that were training out of the country or, you know. Um, yeah. So I, it's, very, it's very interesting. Um, you know, uh, USADA has been, I want to say, not complacent during this whole um, pandemic, but definitely you can see that there was some lax there. Um, as I know, a couple of fighters in the UFC, and, um, they were not testing as heavily um, on some of these guys. And, you know, that's, to me, that just doesn't seem like they're, uh, uh, you know, treating the fighters in the U.S. with that same kind of uh, stringency, you know? So. That, that is true. Know, Please continue. Oh, no, I mean, it's just one of those things where uh, that's not the first time I've heard of that, you know, with uh, USADA having trouble testing some of the fighters out of the country. So, um, you know, I'll be interested in seeing, you know, some more some more comments on that from, you know, uh, news reporters. And, and, and Yeah, and that, we've got to keep an eye on that, man. For example, like, I cannot believe that Costa is in that weight category. That dude looks huge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, I have trouble cutting to 170, and that's, <laughs> more so my national weight class and i i walk around it like 200 pounds um yeah. so you know just making that weight cut from like 225 it's crazy you know I, i'm not saying that it would be a hard cut to 85 but it would still it, i'd still have to cut some weight for that so yeah man it's, 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 not, it's not easy so man it's like uh yeah it's crazy with this guy but it's just like he's just like um on at least on tv he looks insanely huge he could easily pass it like mm -hmm. a like for a light heavyweight or something like that but it's gonna be a great fight man there's a lot a lot of emotions involved as well by the two fighters easy still like um there like try to protect his uh his winning streak and everything and costa like he has something to prove over there in brazil he said you know and that he will destroy yeah. easy and he will not like uh let it uh, to the judge's hands and everything so let's see what happens man i hope it's a good one i think it's going to be a very yeah, exciting fight costa gets it to the ground I'd be really interested to see if Costa's the first one to take him down and, 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 and show what Izzy can do on the ground. So um, I know Izzy is dangerous there. And, you know, it'd be really exciting to actually just see some of Izzy's ground game in, in play, you know, and, and see where he really stands there. Because for me, I, I love to see the complete package. Like, you know, yeah. being a great striker is, 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 is wonderful, but this is mixed martial arts. So uh, I definitely would love to see his skill on the ground, you know, just to, um, see a display of that. That definitely, man. Plus, is the people that I know. Like for example, I've been watching a lot of. Uh, now that I'm, I'm, I'm resting my knee because I have a knee injury. I stopped training and everything. Um, yeah. But the people that do, that know jujitsu, grappling, wrestling, and all that, and they see a match of that, it's quite entertaining because it's very. You learn a lot. You know, you you concentrate a lot on the technique. You you concentrate on their movement. But people that don't know, it just becomes yeah. extremely boring, you know. Yeah. And I remember um, my 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 uh, brother-in-law was here one day, and I was watching this um, 2019 ADCC's final. Oh. You know, it was like that, and I was like so concentrated and everything. And and you know, like in a jiu-jitsu in a jiu-jitsu match, it's not that the crowd is not screaming and shouting, right? It's more of a little bit of a silence in the, compared to to MMA or boxing or stuff like that. But I, and I was like the same, concentrated, concentrated on the fight, and, uh, checking out their techniques and what will be their next move and all that, how they, they control their breathing. And all of a sudden my, my, my brother-in-law said like, that's easy. You know, I would like to, I would <laughs> like to wrestle you with that. You know, and immediately I was like, oh, nice. Like, man, have you, have you trained that? Like, that's so cool. Have you trained that? Like, nah, that's, that's easy. And everything, I was like, "Oh man!" So he's one of those 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 MMA fans that are like sitting on the couch and saying, ah, "That's easy," you know. And I even hey, told him, "Listen, man, let's let's do this. Let's do one wrestling. But if I if I submit you, if I make you tap out in under one minute, you have to buy me this gift." And he was like, "No, okay, like no, it's okay. Let's do it. like let's leave it like that." <laughs> he didn't want to, man. Yeah, I have some friends like that. Uh... When I visited home, I had a couple of friends that wanted to uh, test out my grappling, and uh, they found out really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Man, but at least, at least they went for it, right? Like the majority of the people that have 
made those comments to me. I remember when I first started doing kickboxing, I was so into it. And I, I took a friend to the, to the training. He has never done kickboxing in his life, never done any, any martial arts. He, he's a, he, he was a big dude. So he was just a gym guy. And after the training was like, man, like, I cannot believe that that guy in your sparring session, like really hit you like a lot of times. And I was like, yeah, he was a kid, by the way, that my opponent at that time. So I was like, yeah, I mean, that kid is really good. I think he's like a Golden Gloves kid and stuff like that. And he was just like concentrated the fact that it was a kid doing that. And I was like, what are you like come and train with me? And I was like, nah, it's too easy. It's too easy. I was like, come on, man, try it. He never tried it. And then I met another, I remember my boss at that time, he, allegedly he's a black belt in Kyokushin, allegedly He's a brown belt in BJJ. Allegedly, he has uh, um, he has never lost a fight in in BJJ, and that he's so good that he can be even uh, beat Michael Bispin and all that. He that that is his own words, man. You know, because he was training out of the UK. This guy, well, again, allegedly, and every time I invited him, let's go train together. Let's go to my gym. He would always postpone it always always postponed but his mouth would run every time even to the point that he would say for example my my trainer at that time my kickboxing trainer uh he's uh from the uk and like i said this guy was training in the uk um and his name i, I told his name his name is darren eli and he's a world kickboxing champion uh five-time uh kickboxing uh uk champion and he just said listen man if I don't know him, if I haven't heard about him, he's nobody. And I was like, whoa, okay. And then when I was talking about Michael Bisping, the count, especially in the UK, that guy is famous everywhere, but in the UK, he's yeah. super famous, but he has never heard of him, you know? And I was like, okay, yeah, that, 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 that shows that you know, right? And everything. And it bothers me, man, these people that just run their mouths all the time but you gotta just like be controlled just yeah just like yeah yeah whatever bro <laughs> they fund it they fund the sport for us so that's great we appreciate those people <laughs> they keep, they, they, we need them to keep watching so we keep our ratings good man that, that's, a, that's a good point man that's a that's a really good point then like, big shout outs to him a big shout outs to all the people that think they can take guys like you, you know, like, thank you, then. <laughs> I wish guys think they could take me. I, I, I'm having trouble finding a fight lately. What's your weight right now? Uh, Probably walking around like 194. Man, there's like, a, where was it? I know in Florida, there's, they're, they're looking for a professional fighter on 200, 200 pounds. Uh, I mean... I mean, it's getting to that point. I'm getting, I'm getting ready to take it just about anything. Uh, you know, we had a we had an offer come through, and it kind of it's sitting on the table right now. But you know, I really hope that the the guy accepts, and if he does, you know, hopefully I'll be fighting shortly. But uh, it's not likely. You know, usually when you get a fight offer like that, and then they're kind of cold on it. They don't yeah. answer right away. It's not a good sign. Man, it's true, dude. It's true. Like, you got to be patient, bro. It's going to come, you know. You're living in, in tough moments, uh, especially being out there in the U.S. out of all places, man, you know. Like you said, with this fire thing, it's just, like, easy, hard to breathe. And every, I remember a couple of years back, I was, uh, we were, me and my family were living out in Costa Rica, and um, this volcano erupted, you know, and it was, the, the, the air was ashy as hell. Yeah, man. And it's a poison yeah it's very common over there you're like all this that was the first experience i had and all of a sudden i see the sky like brown you know and i in my mind I was like oh this this is a huge storm coming and then i looked out i was in the office at work i looked out and my car was I, my car was brown as well it's just like with all this dust and you can feel it in the in, in uh, while, while you breathe but funny enough people even with that i guess they're so used to it they will never wear masks and everything that was just like taken to that breathing, which is hard, man. Another stroll. Another stroll in the park right there. Yeah, pretty much, man. Pretty much. Because like, I remember because uh, before it erupts, uh, there's like a, a small shake, right? Like, and people that don't know would like get like a little bit scared about it. But over there, it's just like, yeah, this is normal. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, training a little tough with it, but uh, I'm making do. You know, I still do my calisthenics and I still do my uh, my uh, func- functional range conditioning, and my cars, and just making sure I'm overall a good athlete. And I'm still strength training because luckily our strength training facility yeah. has a, a, a ventilation system and they have car- they have these uh, uh, fans and they have like filters on them and all this stuff. So luckily I'm still able to go get my strength training and, and my cryo recovery. That's been super important. You know, something that I've added to my, um, my training and my development and I see the change in my body. So, you know, I'm just glad that I'm, I'm sticking to that still being a good athlete, even though I'm, I'm taking some time off from MMA training. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you a chance to be complacent. I want to say, you know, I know a lot of guys are taking this time to kick back and drink beers and, you know, it's, it's not, that's not what I'm doing. That's for sure. Man, that, that is so true. Like uh, me, for example, with this, uh, with this injury, I just mm-hmm. got sloppy, man. Like I haven't, I'm on the couch all the time. I, I gain weight. I'm not moving. I'm feeling guilty now, man. Like I, I gained so much weight in the past two months. It's insane. Injuries are an interesting one because injuries kind of, make you face adversity in a different way um you know and and i think the the true challenge is when you're healthy is being able to get back into the gym and and climb that mountain all over again you know that's the big part um because you know i've i've experienced a couple of injuries in the past year i want to say and you know i even went into my fight with an injury my last fight over a year ago and you know, I think it's just a, a matter of how you, you handle it when, when you're healthy and you don't have a fight coming up. Um, it's different for when, when you're injured and you don't have a fight coming up. The, the most important thing is to make sure that your car gets to point B from point A, you know? Yeah. So, man, that's a, that's a good are, advice, man. Definitely, you know? Because uh, when it comes to injuries, I've been very, very dumb about it very very stupid you know like ego takes over and i've been silent about my injuries i let them heal on them on their own i have competed with injuries i still go training with well i used to still go training with injuries and that has um well i can see the 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 the, the ramifications of them today you know i can feel them you know uh, because they're not healed properly i have problems with my back with my neck with my nose with my jaw and now with the knee, like with the with the knee, the knee is not an old. I mean, it's not a new injury; it's an old one. Just so happens that this time I did tear some ligaments, and, and yeah. I like. And even now, even with the knee, I still try to make some movements. I try to walk, and and it's just like insane. Because I was so excited, man. Like I, I I made I was going to have a fight on the on fourth of October. It was going to be my first fight. I already made weight for it. I was training hard, and then boom, this happened like definitely I'm bummed out and then I was like no nah, okay I was accepting the fight I was not going to compete this year maybe next year is going to be my first competition in MMA and uh but I was like okay but maybe I can go back training by September now that it's September man I'm nowhere near training you know like my knee is very weak it still hurts so I just got to be patient with all that yeah yeah patience is is a uh is a hard thing to have in this sport because uh, that FOMO really kicks in, you know, that fear of missing out because this is a sport where it moves so fast, you know, and, and, you know, the only thing that people really care about in this sport is, Oh, when's your next fight? When's your next fight? You know, when are you fighting? Um, I've kind of seen that, especially being on the shelf so long, I've seen that where um, you'll have a lot of, of right now fans, a lot of people that will, you know, want to know how you're doing when you're fighting, but the second that you've been on the shelf for a little bit, or, you know, you're just, you know, you're just on your, your time off, you know, waiting, waiting for an opportunity to pop up. Um, you don't necessarily lose those fans, but they go dormant, you know, kind of like a volcano. They go dormant, you know, and it's like an eruption because once, once you're back on the map, once you're back in the spotlight, then they all come to the surface again. And, uh, you know, it really shows you and teaches you to be more humble with yourself and, 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 and more patient with yourself too, and not try to uh, put too much pressure on yourself or, or beat yourself up um, during those times. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. You gotta be humble. You gotta be patient, like you said. It's, it's good to taste that 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 patience of someone 
especially if you want to be someone in the game, in the MMA industry and everything, you know, because yeah. I wish, like you were mentioning <clears throat> sometime in the past, I wish that people would be more aware of what happens to fighters behind the scenes, as yeah. opposed to just like uh, coming to a conclusion of, on, on one fight, you know, because people don't know everything that happens bef before that fight. It's, it's tough, man. Like, especially for you guys, professional fighters are living, making a living out of MMA. It's not a, I mean, it's not for everyone. It's not easy. Like in your case, you gotta be, you gotta be uh, physically ready for when somebody calls you, okay, there's a fight and you don't know when that could happen. Yep, you just so that be could be frustrating. Yeah. And I've seen it happen to a couple guys that get called up to the UFC that I personally know. It's tough to watch because, you know, they're walking around a little heavy. They get the short term or short notice fight. Now they've got to cut all this weight. Now that's weighing on them. Um, they weren't in the gym training as much as they should have on their off time. Um, and then you see them go in there and put up a great fight uh, and then, you know, and then lose. And then, you know, I find myself not being very remorseful or empathetic because, you know, this is if this is your career then you should you should be ready to go you should be ready to fight at all times and you know that happens a lot in this sport a lot of really good fighters miss out on great opportunities because uh you know it, it, it the cards weren't in their favor because they didn't shuffle the deck the right way you know? yeah correct They're, yeah but i i feel for example i've been i've been reading a lot about uh remember the questions i send you I've been reading about your answers, your background, man. Like uh, you had a tough background. So you grew up in yeah. Florida. Yeah, I grew up in Florida. Uh, you know, I had a, a, a deaf mom growing up. Uh, dad wasn't around for like the first eight years. He was in prison. Uh, I grew up visiting him in prison, um, getting to know him that way. Um, and then he came home when I was like eight years old. And then, you know, got a solid couple of years to really get to know him and grow to be best friends with him. Um, and then uh, he passed away suddenly when I was 13. So, yeah. Your, your mom is still child. with you? Yeah. 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 She lives in Florida with my grandma. Um, I grew up living with my grandma mostly and my mom. Uh, you know, they kind of were like the co-parents, you know, I'd always come home and ask my grandma how her day was. And, um, you know, she'd always be in the kitchen whipping up something. You know, she's very sweet, uh, sweet old old Christian woman, super nice, you know. Always, always very um, uh, kind uh, to a lot of people. Man, that's nice. How, were, how was your communication with your mom? You know, like the sign language and everything? Yeah, so, I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, fluent in ASL and, um, it's a little tougher in these times because my mom's not as technologically advanced as, um, you know, other people are just because yeah. of her, she just lacks some frustration with it because sometimes she doesn't know exactly, like the culture, it's kind of hard for older parents to even comprehend technology if they're hearing, let alone if they're not. So, um, you know, she's done pretty good over the years and has gotten better with technology, with her phone, having a phone, yeah. um, you know. We didn't speak very much when I was away at college. Um, and if we did, it was on the phone through a voice interpreter, um, you know, and then Facebook Messenger got the video chat option. Um, but my mom's very resilient, you know, and I feel like that's where a lot of my strength comes from um, is my mom, you know, just because I've seen her raise me. She raised my three older brothers, um, you know, and I, growing up, I had three older brothers, and that's why I'm so tough. Uh, <laughs> because I had them wailing on me the whole time. Uh, but they also didn't live with me very long throughout my childhood either. So they all kind of moved out as they got older. Yeah, man. Like, I can, I can relate to that a lot, you know, especially with a, like, the, the how can I say, the troubles when you're, when you're a young kid in the family. Mm -hmm. I remember I have, I have one older brother, one older sister, but I never lived with them. You know, my older brother, my two, my older brother and older sister are, are um, American. 
-hmm. And I remember when I was like four, my older brother went to the um, United States Air Force. And since four until today, I'm 35 today, I have only seen him twice. But I do, I am uh, in contact with him over the phone and, 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 and what's up and all that. With my sister, I lost complete communication. I know she's in LA. I, I think she knows I'm out here in Finland, but we just lost communication. Uh, I guess yeah. it happens with time, you know, when you live, where, especially the age difference was so big and we live in different countries and stuff like yeah, that, same. man. But like through all those struggles, you mentioned that you were introduced to wrestling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah was so that like, a, I, yeah, continue, please T tell me about that. Uh, when I was 13, I'm, and this is how I got closer with my oldest brother, um, Steven, we weren't as familiar with each other um, as, as I guess we wanted to be. Um, and, you know, a, a funny fact is like me and my three brothers um, have different dads. So my three older brothers have their dad who is also hearing impaired. Um, he was also deaf. Um, and then uh, I had my dad. And when my dad passed, uh, that's currently who my mom was married to at the time. And uh, we actually moved in with my older brother uh, on off base of Fort Bragg in North Carolina because the bank had foreclosed on our house right after my dad passed. So after that happened, uh, me and my mom and my uh, older brother, uh, this is the one that's just a few years older than me, but he's the, the middle brother. He, uh, me and him moved in with the oldest brother and lived with him and his wife and his daughter uh, in, off base in North Carolina. And I was getting into a lot of trouble um, wrestling. Like, uh, you know, I was always just like a very rumbunctious kid, I want to say. And uh, had a lot of energy, especially after my dad passed. And uh, uh, my older brother kind of told me I needed to pick something up. And uh, I got into a fight at school and the wrestling coach pulled me aside after he saw it. Because, uh, you know, he was just like, hey, man, like, uh, you should get into wrestling, man. I think it'll help you out a lot. And uh, he was also my history teacher. Uh, I think his name was Mr. Daltrey. Daltrey. And uh, super awesome guy, man. Definitely helped me find some guidance in that troubling time as a youth. And uh, wrestling, I want to say, saved my life. You know, it really took me down the right path because I could have gotten involved in some pretty, some pretty bad stuff. You know, gang violence was, was pretty rough around those, the, uh, those times around that city. And, uh, you know, I, I picked up wrestling and I went 12 and one, you know, Whoa. as an eighth grader, never wrestled in my life before that. And I went 12 and one. So I did pretty good. And uh, from there, man, it just spiraled into this super, super uh, big passion for it. Now, I still wanted to play football really bad. And when I got to high school, that's where I picked up football and really thought I, I always had this like idea that I was going to go D1. You know, I was like, oh, I'm going to be D1. I'm I'm going to play in the NFL. And I had this big dream. And then uh, my wrestling coach uh, in, in high school actually kind of opened my eyes a little bit and was like, man, you're 5'11". You know, you're not as fast as they want you to be, this and that. He's like, I really think you have a future in wrestling. And, you know, I think it was around the end of my sophomore year, I really started to take wrestling seriously. Um, and, you know, I, I started wrestling over the summer. And, and before I knew it, I was wrestling 365, wrestling on national teams. And, you know, uh, you know, and I remember the UFC being a, a, a huge, a huge goal for me one day. Um, so it was really, it was really nice for that to develop into what it's developed into today. Man, that's amazing that you kept that grind that definitely sports, if you approach it the right way, can have a very positive influence in your life. Like you said, wrestling oh, yeah. saved your life. For me, man, it started with Kung Fu and Kung Fu kept me out of trouble, you know, so much. I remember I started Kung Fu at 12. At that time, yeah. my, my, my home was just so toxic. I didn't want to be home, man, you know? And, yeah. and, and because yeah. of it was so toxic on purpose, I would go, I would go to trainings like one hour before and then I would mm -hmm. stay an hour after. So I would do that every day. I would go there to train just one hour, but I would stay three hours. 
And then my trainer was like, my coach at that time, he was, why don't you just train the three hours if you can? And I was like, okay. And I did it. I love it. And he was a big influence for me, man. Like uh, my coach was like my father at that time. Shout outs to Mr. Yeah. Ivan, you know, like, um, yeah. you know, it's just like, uh, he was a great guy. He would advise me. And then uh, my Kung Fu, the Kung Fu Academy became like a second home. Like after school, I would go directly there. I would do my homework there. And then I would change for, 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 for training. And I would just try to train as much as I can. But just, yeah, of course I liked it a lot. I loved it, you know? But the fact that the thing that drove me to train so much was the fact that I didn't want to go home. You know, I just no, didn't want to go home. And then slowly but surely develop, I, I developed this big love for the sport and everything. And I remember at that time, uh, at least in, in the academy that I was at, you had to earn your, your white belt. You know, like uh, you didn't start with a white belt. You had to earn your white belt after six months of training and so forth. And um, yep. I remember I was competing already without having earned my white belt. And I was like already in, 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 a, in advanced categories and winning mm -hmm. competitions. So I was like, man, this is fun as hell. You know, like, let me like invest more time to it. And then it just became my whole life, Kung Fu, you know. <laughs> I actually, not a lot of people know this. I actually started in Kung Fu when I was young. I, uh, oh. I trained in Hapki because my dad's brother, my uncle, owned his own, own dojo. And both of his sons were black belts. And, uh, and those were my cousins. And uh, I think my cousins both currently fight MMA still in, out in North Carolina. And... Uh, uh, yeah, humble beginnings, man. I, I remember going into the dojo like super scared and nervous, but ended up doing really well against the other kids that all had belts. Yeah. Um, just because of my pure grit and, uh, you know, my, I want to say because of my older brothers too. You know, they really taught me how to how to fight back and, and how to take care of myself. Man, that, that's good. Man. I wish I would say that my older brother taught me how to fight back, but I was forced how to fight back. Uh, I remember that time my mom sent me to military school. It was this boarding military school because I was doing bad at, at, uh, at school, like with grades and all that. And my mom was like, hey, listen, if you don't raise your grades, I'm going to like send you to military school. And I was like, yeah, whatever, you're bluffing. And boom, it happened. And I was like, shit, okay, let's make the best out of it. I thought it was going to be like normal school, but it was, oh my God, I hated it, man. Because we had to sleep there. We had dorms and everything. And then, oh wow, I, I was never introduced to fighting. I, I never knew about fighting other than what I saw on TV, except when I got there, man. It was like fighting every day. And I remember like people, they were like, my classmates were teasing on me and everything. And then I just was forced to defend myself. And crazy as it sounds, I was like, man, this is easy. I can beat everyone here in my class. You know, and it happened like that. I was like, uh, what grade? I was like in fourth grade. And I was like, because everybody there, all the kids were fighting all the time. So uh, I was like even fighting guys from sixth grade and everything. But in my mind, I was like, okay, I know how to defend myself, but there's nothing to it. Then when I got to Kung Fu, it was different. You know, there was no aggression behind it. I was just having fun. And that helped me a lot. Uh, but when I went to, when from Kung Fu, I made the transition to kickboxing. And that's where I was like, man, banging is for me. I love to throw hands. And is that I discovered that when I was, it's funny because like when I was fighting, those three minutes, man, it gave me control, gave me peace. And I lived in the moment. It was a different feeling. And I got addicted to that feeling until today. <laughs> you know? So even, even though I, I, I cannot fight like I used to, but I still try to, like, uh, I love sparring and everything. I am the only one that said, like, okay, only three rounds. And I'm, I will be exhausted and dead tired of three rounds. And I'm like, let's go one more round, <laughs> you know? I want to say K through 12, I probably got in a fight every single year. Multiple times on some years. <laughs> yeah. And I've always been, I don't want to say a, a troubled kid, but definitely one that uh, 
always found himself in a fight somehow. Um, <laughs> even what, if I was one, um, you know, between kids that are peers, you know, uh, poking and prodding and, and, and instigating, uh, I always found myself in the middle of it. Um, I've always been drawn to fighting, you know. Yeah. I think it's just the warrior spirit that, that is inside of me, you know. Um, and I really, I really truly believe some people are just born to fight and that is, and, and, and it's a passion. You know? I agree, and, man. And you fall, you fall in love with the lifestyle. And, it, and it's beautiful because you can really grow as a person in that lifestyle. Mm. Man, uh, you were, uh, you met Matt Hamill, right? Or am I confused? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, I met him through my mom. So my oh. mom attended rock. Institute for the Deaf, and that's actually where Matt Hamill went. And it was like a, a reunion of some sort that my mom dragged me along to go with her to her and my dad. And uh, my dad actually struck up like a like a friendship with him, kind of. Nice. And uh, yeah, it was super cool. I was I'm trying to remember how old it was. I couldn't have been nine or ten. And uh, And we actually, he actually snuck me into a bar where he was doing like a screening for all the people from the college to come and watch one of his fights. Uh huh. And, uh, and the, the, the security guy didn't want to let me into the bar. And then Matt Hamill looked at him and was like, nah, like he's coming in with us. Nice. And, uh, it was so cool. I got to stand next to him and my dad and him and my dad were just, you know, shooting the shit the whole time. And, um, I, I just remember it vaguely just being a really good time. And, We, uh, you know, we drove out there um, and, you know, I think that's one of my younger motivations because I knew that that would make my dad proud um, to, to see me do something like that. And that's been a, a huge goal for me is to do things that I knew would make him proud, you know, um, Man, yeah. you know it's really for me. Man, that, that's good. Yeah. Like meeting, meeting a guy like Matt Hamill must be impressive must be extremely nice motivating as well man because i i i became fans of uh, fans of the guy uh when um when he participated in the ultimate fighter you know? oh yeah man he was awesome. i i could i rewatched the uh, the ultimate fighter because i remember watching it as a kid but i didn't watch the one that he was on with bisping the count of course yeah and uh you know it's funny to see his hard-headed personality because that's just how all deaf people are they're so resilient and so strong. And like, I hope to give them more of a voice as I continue with this platform and use this platform, um, you know, because, you know, I feel like they're very misunderstood people. And, you know, they're some of the strongest, most resilient, most community-based individuals that I've ever met. Um, and, you know, and it's a beautiful thing that I think a lot of people miss out on because you know, language is something that a lot of people are blessed with. And yes. when you don't, when it's vibrations, you know, when you speak vibrations into the universe, it's a much different connection than using hand signs, you know, and that's why facial expressions are so important. And, uh, you know, I just, it, it saddens me when I hear about some of the things that I, I see them struggle with, but Um, I definitely hope to, to be a difference in that in the future. Maybe you can become even an advocate for these people with your platform, with the fighting and everything, just become a role model with the, with the experience and background that you have. Also your own mom Absolutely. being, being uh, hearing impaired as well, you know? Because like, like I said, yeah. this guy, Matt Hamill, man, he went far. I remember like, I was already a big fan of him, but I just like seeing him on, on, on The Ultimate Fighter and a couple of wrestling fights on YouTube. But then I remember at that time, Netflix was new here to, um, to Finland, but his movie mm -hmm. was there. Like they made a movie about him, but I didn't know it was about him. You know, I was like, okay, it's this wrestling movie, boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden, oh shit, is this the guy from the Ultimate Fighter? And that made, I Google researched that night. It was like, oh, it's him. And yeah, it shows all the struggles that he went through. And I'm sure that he's not the only one going through all of that. You know, and having yeah. a person that doesn't belong in that circle like yourself, uh, but being understanding of what they've gone through yeah. would mean a lot, you know, definitely. Oh, so, I mean, so they tell already me, feel ill. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, you said the wrestling saved your life. 
And a lot of people that do MMA, they start from wrestling. What made you choose MMA? What made you make that transition? You know, I think that came about in college. Um, you know, I, I had this goal when I was in high school. I was like, oh, I'm going to go to wrestling and I'm going to be an NCAA uh, champion. And after I, I'm a champion, then uh, I, I'm going to get into the UFC. You know, that was my plan. I just thought it was going to be that easy. <laughs> yeah. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I learned uh, about wrestling was, you know, it, it, it's one dimensional. Um, you know, wrestling is, is wrestling. And for some reason, I had lost my, my, my fighting spirit um, when I got to college because, like, I was this big recruit to a smaller college. You know, I was 2,500 miles away from home, just turned 18. And, you know, I love my mom, but she was so controlling um, over me in high school. And we butted heads a lot, you know. And, you know, we always fought, and you know, she even called the cops on me a couple times. It's some crazy stuff, you know. And uh, the one thing that I can appreciate is her resilience, and I think that's what carried me through to MMA because I, I knew I wasn't done. You know, I had I reached the pinnacle in high school for that part of my career for wrestling, and when I got to college, I I I, I saw that to do it all, you had to be a student athlete and school just I, I just decided that school wasn't for me and I was struggling so much with that uh internally that I turned to drinking I turned to drugs I turned to all these things to try and find out who I was and and what I truly wanted to accomplish and yeah you um, wanted to fill that luckily, void man yeah man I just you know a competitor needs to compete end of story and uh you know and, and I was just struggling so much to pay for college because after I lost my scholarship that first semester, I just, I was lost. I was lost. And I tried for like a year and a half and it, it just didn't work out. And, uh, you know, I was working and, and before you knew it, I found myself, uh, I trained at this gym a couple times that was in North Dakota called Cal Calavera's martial arts. Okay. And the only way that I, I had an in there was our wrestling team captain, John Wilson, who now is the owner of Wilson bros grappling. He's the co-owner with his brother, Marcus uh, Wilson. Uh, Marcus is a black belt. John's a brown belt now. And uh, John was teaching classes there. And uh, I, I don't remember him specifically ever asking me to come in there. Um, but I found my way in there. And he's like, oh, funny you showed up here, you know. And he knew I was a good wrestler. And he knew I had good potential. Um, and he was kind of hard on me like an older brother. And I really appreciate him for that. He really did remind me a lot of my older brother. And, uh, you know, the one thing I liked about him is he, he didn't necessarily treat me like a kid, but he also didn't treat me like uh, uh, like an adult. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of like that middle ground. And, uh, you know, I trained there. And after I started trying jujitsu, it was the most eye-opening experience for me because I realized there was so much more to combat sports. You know, I thought wrestling was the pinnacle of combat sports, and I was wrong. And it relit that fire, and my striking was horrible. Um, my grappling was subpar, and, you know, I was struggling with these, like, blue belts, and, like, purple belts would just have their way with me and could talk shit to me while we're rolling. And, <laughs> you know, I didn't even have the chance to roll with the true black belt at that time. And because uh, I think the highest belt there was, like, the – uh, a brown belt because they were one of those gyms where like the black belt professor would come out and do promotions every now and again because uh, they were just a branch gym okay. so I'm mean, after doing jiu-jitsu and training with a couple of their amateur fighters you know um, at the same time life was happening right so then I started working in the oil field because I had to make money I wanted to afford an, my own apartment and all of these things and you know, I saw a really good future in that. And I, I, you know, I was just, you know, I had given up on wrestling. I put it down. And then I found myself, you know, working in the oil field and just drinking myself to death, just depressed. But the only thing that made me happy was driving that two and a half hour drive from location just to make open mats at noon. You know, I would drive two and a half hours just to, just to go roll for an hour, if that. Or, or just get into the gym, you know, John would let me in or whoever was there for the, the, the morning time would let me in. Even though most of the rigorous training happened in the evening, 
I just wanted to show up and, and do something, you know, I'd hit yeah. the bag. And then, you know, whenever I had off days, I would try to make those evening classes. And uh, I would just feel so good after doing that. And, and nothing had ever made me feel like that besides wrestling. But this was a whole different ballgame. And uh, I called my buddy, you know, one of my best friends that lived out in Oregon at the time. And I was like, dude, you know, and he came to uh, Minot State because of me and wrestled there. Um, he ended up getting kicked off the team for personal reasons. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I was like, dude, I got to get out of here, man. And, uh, you know, I called him. And, you know, he was like, dude, just move to Oregon. Screw it. You know? Yeah. And that's like when that. I made the decision. Just like that. Yeah. I started researching MMA gyms. I was like doing all this research and I would have gone to, at the time they were Gracie Baja, um, mm-hmm. but now they're American top team Portland. Um, and I almost went there, but my buddy lived in Eugene and I wanted to live close to him. So I moved to Eugene and found Art of War MMA. And from there, that's, that's really where it all took off, man. That's where I plunged in head first. I was actually working a job when I got here and quit my job to take my first MMA fight. Wow. You know, my coach gave me the ultimatum. He's like, Hey man, you're not, you're not here enough. He's like, I'm not going to let you fight if you don't put in the the training needed. I don't feel comfortable sending you in there like that. Yeah. So I quit my job. I trained hard. You know, my opponents changed like twice. And then the day before the fight, I cut like 15 pounds because I got a night's notice. It was nuts. It was, Man, it's I got I gotta say it's very impressive everything that you have done, all the sacrifices, and still keeping at it. It's it's tough, like we were saying at the beginning of the conversation, man. Uh, even a lot of people may have love for the sport and love for fighting, but they don't have that discipline or the resilience that you have or that many other fighters have. You know, uh, props to you, man. Yeah. I hope you keep it on. Um, we are, as you know, I have told you, we myself, Jog Farm we are huge fans of you we want you to succeed and everything anything that we can let us know to help you uh just move up man like we would we love to be part of your journey just having you in our platform is a pleasure man and, and now getting to know you more is just unbelievable man you are a talented guy and you're going to places and it, it's just a pleasure being uh being able to witness all that i appreciate that man uh and i appreciate the the people along my journey that have helped me you know um because it, it, it all those things played a part in getting here and getting to where i'm at and, and teaching me things because growing up i didn't learn a lot of sociable and personal skills from you know my family as i did all the people around me you know the people that took me in as family you know my best friend in high school really showed me like how to how to be amongst i want to say the more popular kids you know if it wasn't for my best friend i wouldn't have known how to even how to even do that you know and he took me out and and and, and helped me grow as a, a, a as a team you know and um you know and the jufri family man they were they were huge supporters of mine and they helped me get through my wrestling career and then as i got to college you know if it wasn't for some of my really good friends that kept telling me i was messing up and um you know, and, and then getting to where I'm at, you know, I'm just thankful for all these great coaches I've had in my life, you know, because my coaches have always been the one to help me stay on track and stay on the path. And, you know, I'm a, I'm super hard headed and I get that from my mom, but it's also <laughs> what makes me a good fight, you know. Um, so it's it's just been it's been beautiful to witness my own growth because sometimes I, I, I was just living in that driver's seat, driving too fast, you know, to even slow down and see some of the work and some of the things that I've put myself through to get here. I, I'm just, I'm just happy to, to be able to still be in a position to chase what I love. Uh, my body's still intact. I'm still, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on being a better person every day, being more open-minded, being more uh, able to uh, want to get more involved in the community as time passes, you know. Um, but as a fighter, you know, you got to be super selfish and I'm, I'm learning how to be more selfish in good ways of course you know, not in, in bad ways you know but uh i think that's just the journey it takes to being a champion you know i want to be somebody like gagey and khabib and 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 george st pierre and, 
in a lot of these champions where uh, their stories, man, are just so beautiful and so inspiring. You can see what impact that's had on these kids and, and, and what good it's done for them. So, you know, I just, I just want to be a part of that because, you know, there could be a kid out there that was just like me that, you know, could have gone a, re- a really bad path because of the yeah. things he was exposed to at a young age, you know, and that's one of the things that, um, you know, I, I really appreciate because a lot of kids need that father figure around, no matter how anybody puts it, you can have the best mom in the world, yeah. but uh, every, every young man needs, needs a good, strong man in his life to, to help guide him and show him the way because, you know, we're all super stubborn, you know, humans as a whole, we're just stubborn because we love to do it alone. You know, and, and the beautiful thing about this MMA journey is that I've done none of it alone. Um, uh, at, as I've gotten to where I'm at now, American Top Team's behind me, Dodge Sports is behind me, Jock Farm's with me. Yeah. You know, I've got some amazing, I got some amazing people around me now, and I just keep building a, a stronger, better team. And, and man, is it going to be awesome when we make it to the top. Man, and you're in the right path. You're getting there. Keep being strong, keep being patient, keep being humble, keep being beautiful, man. <laughs> Just keep, yeah. keep at it. Staying heathen as fuck. <laughs> yeah, brother. Yeah, definitely, man. You know, and like soon I'm going to send you like an invite for you to, when they open borders, man, I'm going to send you an invite for you to come to Scandinavia and get to experience the real oh. Norse culture, brother. I got to, man. I'm going to do some, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up all them birth certificates and death certificates of my family. So I can actually learn a little bit more about them and where I truly come from. Um, Cause that's crazy to me too. You know, it's like I got so much heritage there that I don't even know about yet. So, man, it's insane, it's man. Like, and I, I have to be like the, the Norse culture, the, the Vi- Viking culture is beautiful. It's beautiful. I, I have mm-hmm. made uh, obviously big fans of the show Vikings, but because of that oh, show is that I made like, uh, I read more about it and stuff like that. It's just, they're very they strong. Warriors, man. Yeah. <laughs> I named my dog Ragnar, so that shows you how much I love it. There you go, man. There you go. But hey, man, like before I let you go, do you want to give any shout outs to someone or to someone's? Yeah, to, to a lot of people. So uh, big shout out to my guys over at Dodge Sports. Matt and Joey do such a wonderful job and on creating great business relationships. Big shout out to Jock Farm. Big shout out to Manscaped. You know, they actually sent me a replacement charger the other day. I really appreciate them for that. Nice. Um, and a, a big shout out to to all my friends and family that keep supporting me, even though, you know, uh, we might not talk as much. And, you know, a big shout out to, to American Top Team, because with them, I have grown into an absolute monster now, a, a true problem in the arena. And I, I'm just so excited to to exploit my skills, man. I am just hungry and waiting and, and going to rip somebody apart when the time comes. And a big shout out to my uh, uh, best friend and training partner, Raymond Hill, because, you know, um, you know, I finally just moved into a place uh, with him and my other, my other training partner, uh, Jalen Hurd, you know, we really got a nice little fight family going on here now. And nice. um, we're going to do big things. We're going to do big things. All right, man. That's fantastic. Then um, you have a good night, buddy, and we'll be in touch for sure. And let us know anything that we can do to help you promote yourself and stuff. And like I said, we want to help. So anything that we can do, let us know. Absolutely. Make sure you guys get over to that Jock Farm website. Sign up. It's the biggest <laughs> MMA platform out there right now. <laughs> Thanks, man. Take care, okay, brother? You have a good one. You too, man. Have a great one. Bye.